The time has arrived. The YouTube series Cobra Kai is released. I'm filled with so much hope, yet preparing myself for the worst. I tune into the first episode of Cobra Kai titled Ace Degenerate. No, X Degenerate, man. Am I going to see an exploitation of one of the most beloved films of my time? Well, three and a half minutes into this episode, and I was hooked. I couldn't have been more delighted with what I saw, and I knew immediately that this show was a winner. I'm Martin Faubert, and welcome back to The Cobra Kai Guy. Like the original film, a certain type of attention was given to Cobra Kai, and by the time the first real dialogue was spoken three and a half minutes into the episode, I was already captivated. How can I be captivated by the first three and a half minutes of a show without any real dialogue? Well, that is what I'm here to show you today. And it's also how I knew right off the bat that the creators behind the show respected the property, were true fans of the film, and prepared to execute their vision properly. Immediately it was the sound, that deep rumbling tone and perfect use of music that any fan can instantly identify as the Karate Kid. Having watched the films more times than I can remember, I like to think I know every scene and angle like the back of my hand. For the creators to take on the incredibly painstaking task of picking through archive film to find unused pieces from the original movies to be used in their flashback scene, that completely blew me away. The use of the sound and music and clipping in of archival footage was brilliant. Someone who respects this property is in control, showing us exactly what we need to see and giving a new viewer who has not seen the original films the perfect setup for the episode. The final scene in The Karate Kid is a work of art, and this revisit gives it the proper treatment it deserves. Right down to leaving in the infamous ad-lib words by the character Tommy. Get him a body bag! Yeah! This scene is immediately followed up by a jump to the present time, where we catch up with the antagonist in the first film, Johnny Lawrence. And yes, I've seen that video. Who was the real bully in The Karate Kid? Well, like I've said, these movies were so masterfully made, we've been analyzing them for over 30 years, including each character's motivation. And in interviews when asked, William Zabka certainly didn't see his character as the bad guy. Now these topics don't go unexplored in the series, which is another thing that makes them so great. Johnny does in many ways see himself as the victim, but as the series continues, it teaches us that life is rarely right and wrong, good and bad, black and white. It's in the shades of grey where life takes place. And in order to thrive, one must find their balance in the sea of grey. When we catch up with Johnny in the present day, we see his life is far from being balanced. I was so intrigued by the opening moments of this show because of the amount of information given to us the viewer was strictly the visuals. Everything we need to know to paint the perfect picture of who Johnny is and where he is in life is told to us without any dialogue. Just meticulously placed props and clever camera angles. The scene opens with the sound of an alarm clock buzzer. I mean, who uses an alarm clock anymore? When was the last time you even heard one of those obnoxious clock buzzer sounds? Our first clue that this is a man behind in the times. I pointed out in my previous video the masterfully placed dusty television set. I can only imagine one of the set designers or prop masters working obsessively to get that dust placed just right. Even the sunlight hits that 90s era TV and stand just right to highlight the dust. A secondhand lamp that was clearly bought from a thrift shop or garage sale, or perhaps left behind by the previous tenant. This single shot is a perfect example of a picture tells a thousand words. The alarm clock, the TV, lamp, even the CDs on the TV stand show us a man stuck in time. The dust shows us the TV, like Johnny, have not moved in years. He's going nowhere, collecting dust. Throughout this seemingly simple scene, watching a man eat breakfast, so much is given to us the audience to absorb. The table, chairs, light fixtures, even the picture on the wall are all data and all scream late 80s, early 90s. I think my older brother had that picture in his first apartment. The man's past glories are stored in the bottom of his closet, 
collecting dust, not unlike him. Frying bologna for breakfast and eating it off of a paper plate. And to top all that off, he also has a son. And judging by the fact that there is only one photo of the boy present and it's dated 2010, he likely does not have much of a relationship with his son. Johnny steps outside, fittingly carrying a bag of garbage. And it is from the point of view of Johnny's garbage that we first see the character Miguel. From a low point of view, looking up past garbage. And now at three and a half minutes into the show, we have our first lines of dialogue from any of the characters. Wow, I mean seriously, wow, all of that information given to us in just about three and a half minutes. And this is how I knew at the three and a half minute mark that this show had it. This is what I mean when I say so much was put into the development of the series. And it was at this point that I finally let out a sigh of relief and thought to myself, good, my beloved Karate Kid has not been retconned into oblivion. After Johnny meets Miguel, drives off in his car, which is another obvious example of Johnny's reluctance to let go of the past, or inability to buy a new car, we know as much about Miguel as Johnny does. We the audience are not given any more information about him than Johnny. His name is Miguel, he and his mom just moved in, and he's a bit of a dork. And he has braces. Old or not, that is still a sick ride. Hey. In this moment we see Ralph Macchio as Daniel LaRusso for the first time in Cobra Kai. And again, with a simple shot we are told plenty about Daniel. He's successful, he's popular, he's rich. He's pretty much in the type of place that Johnny was in the first film when young Daniel was the one living on the poor side of town. Now when I first saw this scene, I actually wondered if this was a parallel between the characters and the actors portraying them. Meaning no disrespect to William Zabka, but his career did not seem to take off like Ralph Macchio's did after the release of the first film. I can only imagine what it would be like for an actor who was in a hit film, put a lot into that film and into the development of his character, and then to struggle to get high profile parts after that. And while struggling in Hollywood, seeing Macchio in the media making a second and third film, I can just picture Zabka going from one audition to another and on the way seeing a huge billboard for the Karate Kid Part 3. Another one. And with that, we are only 10 minutes into the first episode and already so much has been thrown at us. Most of it was very subtle, but all of it added to the overall tone. There is so much in the first episode alone I want to point out to you, but I promised myself I'd keep these videos short. So check out my next video where we're going to be taking a look at a few more moments in the first episode of Kobukai, Ace Degenerate. And thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, please consider liking the video, subscribe to the channel, comment below, and I'll see you next time on the Cobra Kai Guy.